Welcome all. Uh, the MFPH Next Generation Seminar Series is a networking event for early career scholars, junior models, and epidemiologists working on or interested in mathematical modeling of infectious diseases and other threats to public health. Bienvenue à tous. La série de séminaires MFPH Next Generation est un événement pour les chercheurs en début de carrière, les modélisateurs juniors, les épidémiologistes travaillant intéressés par la modélisation mathématique des maladies infectieuses et d'autres menaces pour euh, la santé publique. First of all, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the Fields Institute operates for thousands of years. It has been traditional land of Yorongwenda, the Seneca, and Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Premièrement, nous souhaitons reconnaître cette terre sur laquelle l'Institut Fields opère depuis des milliers d'années. C'est la terre traditionnelle des Rwanda, des Sénèques, des Sogas. Aujourd'hui, ce lieu de rencontre abrite encore de nombreux peuples euh, autochtones de tout Churchill Island et nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir l'opportunité de travailler sur cette terre. Our guest today is Dr. Alia Mundo Ortiz, received his PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Arkansas in the US, and he is currently a postdoc fellow uh, at Université de Montréal, co-sponsored by the Centre de Recherche uh, Mathematique and the Fields Institute under the MFPH initiative. His work lies in, at the intersection of infectious diseases, longitudinal data, and reproducible uh, research. Oh, notre invité aujourd'hui, sera Dr. Ariel Mondortis, qui a obtenu son doctorat en génie biomédical de l'Université de Arkansas en euh, 2022. Il est actuellement postdoc à l'Université de Montréal, coparrainé par le Centre de recherche mathématique et le Fields Institute euh, dans le cadre d'initiatives MFPH. Son travail se situe à l'intersection des maladies infectieuses, des données longitudinales et de la recherche reproductible. His talk will be on using statistical methods and reproducible uh, tools to gain new insight from biomedical and public health data. La présentation portera sur usage des méthodes statistiques et des outils uh, reproductibles pour acquérir de nouvelles connaissances à partir de données biomédicales et de santé publique. Uh, Dr. Ariel Mundo, thank you very much. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Idris. Thank you for having me today here. Really excited. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for, for coming today and uh, spending some time in, in to, to come to attend to the talk. So as it was mentioned before, I will be talking about stat statistical methods and reproducible tools uh, and how those uh, how we have used those to analyze biomedical and public health data. So it's probably going to be a little less on the math side, uh, but it's going to be a little bit more on the applied side. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions or anything, you can, you can stop me during the talk or you can wait until the end. And as, as it was mentioned, I work at the Université de Montréal and uh, really excited to, to, to show some of the work we have been doing here in the lab. So I would like to start this talk by saying that uh, you know, it's pretty obvious to all of us that data is the core of research. We collect data, being it on clinical, uh, from from uh, field experiments or or getting data from another uh, uh, agency that, that gets the data. But data is not information. So we we actually want to extract information from the data, and then we need to process the inform the data before we can get to information that's meaningful. And this is especially crucial in the case of health research, being it public health or biomedical or epidemiology. Um, there are many decisions that go along the process and when you're working with data, and uh, those decisions are gonna drive how you interpret your data at the end of the day. So uh, in this talk, I'll, I will focus on two examples that showcase you know, this, uh, how the decisions you make, and you know how maybe looking for something a little bit out of the box can result in more insight in the data you have, and uh, with the you know aim of running or, or prospects of you know how we want to treat data and how we want to uh, analyze the health data. 
So the, the first uh, case I'll talk about is about uh, public health data, and it's going to be about uh, COVID-19 vaccination. So, well, why? Well, the, the pandemic's still ongoing, right? Well, that's that's why we're able, we're more used now to do this kind of some uh, type of meetings. Um, but COVID-19 vaccination uh, has been an important component of uh, public health strategies aimed at managing the pandemic. And this is basically because we all know that, you know, the, the vaccines were rapidly developed and uh, initially it was thought that um, the fact that they were available so early uh, in a relatively, sorry, relatively in a short time frame within the pandemic, they would get help um, the world to get over with the pandemic. Obviously that has not been the case, uh, why? Because there are uh, inequities, uh, you know, uh, uh, countries or some countries have more access to vaccines than others. And uh, even within those countries, there uh, has been uh, differences in vaccination uptake. So that, that means that within a country uh, or within, a, within a, uh, a series of countries, you can have differences within the population of the country because not all uh, segments of the population get the vaccine at the same rate. And uh, for example, it had been shown multiple times that, uh, you know, there are many studies that have shown that uh, individuals that have lower income or that below belong to a racial or ethnic minority have had lower vaccination uptake. Uh, and, you know, this, why do we care about this? Well, it's mainly because these differences in vaccination um, still have implications on how uh, herd immunity works, if you know uh, there are more mutations that come into play, or or there are more peaks of the of, of the pandemic, so vaccine uh, access and vaccine uptake has implications in the public health space. So that's why this is important. And uh, well, so how there are, there are multiples of ways of seeing this, right? But uh, the one we we did is because uh, we uh, uh, we're very fortunate to uh, get our hands on, on some data for, that actually the Fields Institute collected between 2021 and 2022. So the Fields Institute during the, the, the first uh, uh, three years of the pandemic collected uh, survey data. And the, the survey was called the Survey of COVID-19 Related Behaviors and Attitudes. So this survey ran between 2021 and 2022. Uh, Fields commissioned this survey to another uh, to a company that you know, was in charge of deploying the survey on, on, on the internet. And the basic idea of the survey was, you know, get information about socioeconomic information of people in Ontario and get information about their vaccination status. So basically, you know, people would answer, you know, what was their household income, how many people would live in through the household and so on and so forth. Uh, what racial minority group, if they belong to one, they belong to, and if they have received the first dose of, the COVID, of a COVID vaccine. And here I have a, a table that summarizes, you know, what kind of information we got from the, from the survey. So we had some different, uh, you know, age group levels, and we have some income brackets, uh, and then we have different race and ethnicities. And um, as I said, you know, we, we were very fortunate to get this data. And, uh, we could have done the same thing that other studies have done, you know, uh, same thing of, you know, just getting a model and running the dependency on vaccination using socioeconomic data. That, that's something, you know, it's valid, but uh, we wanted to bring something else. We wanted to, to provide some more insight, you know, and things that might be happening. And, uh, you know, what, what could we get from this data? So the, the thing is that Ontario, in particular, has had some interesting changes in healthcare within the last, uh, well, now almost three years, um, which motivated us to do some extra, to uh, so use a different approach. And I'll, and I'll provide some context to that. So between 20, uh, 2006 and 2019, Ontario was divided in what uh, were called uh, local health integration networks, or LHINs for short. Uh, what were this this uh, local health integration network? So they were basically uh, geographic intraprovincial divisions, intraprovincial divisions that basically determined where you could get he healthcare. So um, and you know this is where it gets interesting because uh, Ontario, uh, from a geographical perspective, from a from an administrative perspective, has different municipalities, and. Uh, when census data is collected, there are other census boundaries that do not 
always match the municipal boundaries. And um, this local health integration network areas uh, were, you know, another type of division of Ontario. Um, and, and they were designed to like uh, um, help uh, people get access to healthcare. And there were 14 local health integration networks. And even within those health integration networks, there were additional subdivisions. Uh, um, I remember exactly, you know, uh, the, the rationale for that, but, you know, there were like intra LHIN divisions. And uh, they worked for, for, for some time, but uh, there were some problems with the local health integration network. So as I said before, uh, one problem in, uh, you know, this is documented, but I also learned of this when I was working with this data, is that uh, the boundary of a local integration health network uh, did not match the municipal boundary. So what this effectively meant is that you could be in, in a city and part of the city would be within a local health integration network and then another part will be with a different one. Uh, it didn't happen always, but it, it happened in some areas. And, uh, you know, this complicates things. This, you know, complicates because people from the same city have to go to different places. Um, and uh, there was a study that identified, you know, by 2012 that this local health integration network approach uh, was complex. And there were problems with funding and bureaucracy because you can imagine all this um, sporting uh, divisions and then with more subdivisions, it was complicated. Um, so in late 2019, I'm talking about maybe December of 2019 or so, Ontario changed the approach uh, because they realized that, you know, uh, the local health integration network approach wasn't working very well. And they adopted what they call the health region approach uh, and phased out the local health integration network approach. So uh, the change is new. And what they basically, what it basically entailed is that then the 14 regions uh, some of them were merged, and then from 14, they went down to six. Uh, however, there are multiple challenges with, you know, this 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 new approach. Uh, and one of the problems is that because the local health integration networks were in place for, you know, a relatively long time, uh, the census data that was collected took that into account. So you could you could go to the uh, Statistics Canada website and you know let, look for Ontario and you will find that there is data that is stratified by local health integration network. Um, that is not the case with the health regions uh, because they are they are new, so there there is a lack of data. You know how things are are, are going in these health regions. So then our interest with the data we had is well. We have this data and uh, part of the, the interesting part of this survey data is that we, when, when someone answered the survey, the survey automatically captured where in Ontario the person was answering the survey. So this, would, this allowed us to add a geographical component to analyze and see, you know, we, are there any differences within the health regions that might be important? So I have a, a map here to like illustrate what I was saying. So. Here, uh, these were the former, you know, the 14 uh, local health integration networks. Um, as you can see that, of course, you know, Ontario is mostly, is most densely populated here in, the, in this part. And these two regions are huge, but you can see that there are, there are even subdivisions within. Uh, you know, they, they call it uh, local health integration networks and then sub local health integration networks. Um, so that was before. And then, you know, some of these were merged and how does it look now? So this is a figure that comes from, you know, the Ontario health uh, regions, the, the, the health plan, business plan from 2022, 2023. You can see that these two regions here on top have remained the same, but here at the bottom, things have been merged. So instead of having, you know, 14 different uh, local health integration networks, now uh, the, the province only has six. Um, and, you know, so, so this is the exact same map, but this is actually, uh, this shows where the, uh, where we were in the data from the surveys. So it's the same, you know, we have the, the six health regions, but now we have uh, where in Ontario were people in answering the survey. Uh, and, you know, as I said before, of course, you know, there's, uh, there's only 5% of total population of Ontario lives within these health regions on, on the north, so uh, more sparse. But here at the bottom, there's a, uh, and each, each point here represents a city from where we, we, we were getting, we were, we were getting, we were getting the, the, 
participation in the survey. A uh, lot of participation here. Um, so effectively, this meant that you know, we had data that we could use to see if there were differences within the health regions, right? So this motivated us, us to like build a model uh, to see you know, likelihood of vaccination or odds of vaccination, but that we could uh, actually implement uh, this geographic, you know, broadly speaking, at the level of health regions to see if there are intra-health region differences. So, uh, of course, we built, you know, a, a logistic regression model, and then we would have, you know, the covariates I showed before, age group, race, or, or ethnicity, the health region people were living in, uh, the income bracket, and then we did some interaction. So, uh, this on top is, you know, what a lot of uh, COVID models have done, you know, just uh, the covariance by themselves. We were interested in seeing, you know, well, are, are there differences we can, uh, if you belong to um, um, a racial minority within a different health region. So this is what this term would allow us to explore. And here it will be if, you know, uh, it is known that people that uh, belong to certain racial groups tend to perform certain type of activities. And that you know that's going to be associated with some 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 type of income. You know, if there are changes as well, or there is a change in office vaccination based on this. So this is the the, the model we 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 used for, for for data we had. And uh, you can imagine that you know with six health regions and all those categories of race and all the income, uh, the results of the model are, are pretty pretty uh, extensive. So I I'm showing you here some of the selected results. Um, and, you know, what, what I would like to highlight here, without getting, you know, too, too much into the numbers, is that, you know, there are, again, um, if we use, we use the reference groups uh, for comparison, you know, uh, to individuals in, within race by Caucasian, uh, held region Toronto, and income that had a, a household income of $60,000, Canadian dollars and above, if we compare, you know, within each of the uh, covariates here, we can see that, <clears throat> again, we see that, you um, some racial minorities have lower odds of vaccination compared to white individuals. Uh, we see that people, you know, within uh, low income brackets have lower odds of vaccination compared to people with high income brackets. Uh, we see that there is a, a slightly higher uh, increase in odds of vaccination in the West Health region compared to Toronto. And then we can see also that when, when we see the interactions, there are also differences in uh, income and race. So for example, here, Individuals that are Arab and Middle Eastern uh, and under uh, twenty-five thousand dollars, so having a household income below that, um, have also a significant difference in in odds of vaccination. So, if we go to race and health region, uh, we see that we have a couple of significant, uh, you know, people that were identified at South uh, identified as South Asian and were in the West Health region or had a um, background racial background that was not captured by the survey you know so they just say they were belong to other racial groups uh from the west hell region you know those also had lower odds of vaccination so <clears throat> again we we are seeing uh the differences by um racial uh and in uh, racial group and ethnicity but we're also seeing uh differences within uh those uh, with interactions so the key point here, right, is how, how do we interpret, interpret this? So this shows that there are uh, there were, at the time of this, when the survey was run, there were disparities in vaccination uptake in Ontario, um, in that people within certain racial minority groups had lower odds of vaccination uh, than white and Caucasian individuals, for example. In, right, you saw this from the slide before, people that had you know lower income, were on lower income bracket, had uh, lower odds of vaccination. But the interesting thing is that uh, if you compare um, what was happening, for example, for, I'll go back to my, to this slide. So we have um, significant here, you know, under 25,000 Canadian dollars and that identified as Arab or Middle Eastern. So what this effectively, this, this value, what it actually means is that also this group in general had lower odds of vaccination than white individuals. This uh, group, uh, you know, this this strata we create by combining uh, income below 20,000, 25,000 in Arab Middle Eastern, they actually had higher odds of vaccination when compared to Arab and Middle Eastern individuals that had higher income. So the interesting thing here is that we see that in the case where we have significant interactions, that basically means that people that uh, were within these racial groups 
that overall had lower vaccination than white individuals, had higher odds of vaccination than people within the same racial group that had higher income. Um, so why do we think this was, was the case? Well, uh, people in racial minorities, as I said before, and those that have you know low income that can be associated with a low household income, uh, work uh, most of the time or, or uh, frequently in uh, what we're considered or are considered still, because we're still in the pandemic, uh, essential occupations, meaning gas station workers, grocery workers, agricultural workers, and thus knowing that they were exposed you know, to a, a high risk in a right high risk environment, they would get the vaccine. Um, and that's why they would have increased odds of vaccination compared to people within the same racial group, but with higher income. And you know, it's also differences between the health regions. Uh, we saw from the table before that South Asian individuals in the West Health region had lower odds of vaccination than in other health regions. So this is interesting as well, because it means that even within the same racial group, depending on which, where are you getting healthcare, there might be, you know, higher or lower odds of vaccination, in this case, lower. And uh, the idea behind this analysis is that uh, we can provide a more comprehensive assessment of, you know, how vaccination has worked in Ontario. Uh, so it's not about, you know, making a, a generalization that, uh, for example, uh, Latin American people have lower odds of vaccination. That, um, from a broad perspective, you know, might be true, but it's 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 likely that within that racial group, there are also differences in vaccination. We, if you consider the income or the health region, so that's really important to consider because that means that uh, public health strategies need to be tailored to address those disparities. So you you cannot treat the racial group as a whole. You know, there may be nuances that you wanna you you, you may wanna be interested in tackling. So this was the idea behind, behind this. Um, so from this part of the talk, a uh, couple of conclusions. So data cleaning is very, very important. And this is not something that is related you know, to, to math or, 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 or statistical analysis. It's just the fact that I can be challenging. Um, so you know, from one side, we have the uh, data sets you can get you know, for geographical data from uh, Stats Canada, Statistics Canada. And those are basically mostly on the local health integration approach. Uh, but you have a data that uh, it's based, you, you want to transfer, transform that into the health regions. And the survey data itself only had, you know, cities, places where people were answering. So you, uh, we had to figure a way to like combine everything, um, uh, make sure that we weren't missing, you know, uh, duplicated names or, or all, all sorts of small things that come in, you know, are likely to have an impact on, on your analysis. And um Take home, you know, personal take home, for, take home point from this is that if if you want to take a more granular view of the data, if your data allows you to do that, uh, and you, you want to see, you know, interactions and 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 go a little further, uh, those can help provide more insight in probably you know public health development, uh, public policy development, and can help provide more information that it's relevant and that can be uh, applied for public health policies. Um, now, uh, limitation of this work is, for example, that, uh, okay, we, we know that there are differences. With the data we have, we cannot answer at the moment, you know, the actual rationale. And this is something that has been uh, going for a while with, you know, this type of study that, you know, show differences in vaccination. Um, it's really hard to put up, you know, cause, a causal uh, uh, rationale, you know, for what, why exactly this is happening. You know, from our case, you know, we, we say probably, uh, the occupation of the people, of the person, you know, the the, the occupation, uh, uh, the exposure they were having with COVID, they were motivated to get the, the the vaccine. There's a need for you know more studies in detail that can actually help you know answer this 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 question. You know, why are we seeing these differences and what is actually driving these differences in vaccination? Um, so that's that's the first part of of my talk, and now I'll I'll switch gears and talk about something a little bit uh, different. So we talk about public health data and you know, how um, going a step further and looking at your data can help you get more insight in you know, some things that might be relevant from, from a public health perspective. I wanna talk about now biomedical data and um, how probably changing statistical models uh, can help provide more insight in, on, on your data and you know, extract more information from your data. So uh, I wanna specifically talk about the case of longitudinal data. And uh, what I mean by this is uh, data that is collected over time. 
So biomedical studies, uh, being in the preclinical or clinical level, uh, often collect long longitudinal data to see the effect of an intervention over time. So for example, uh, if you have, for example, an animal study, for example, in mice or, 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 uh, or rats, and you are using a new um, uh, chemotherapy treatment, what is typically done is that you have a control group and a treatment group, uh, and then you give the control group um, just maybe water or, or, or just inject them a saline solution, but the chemotherapy group is going to receive the drug, and then you're making measurements over time. And for example, if you have a cancer study where the animals are likely to have, you know, uh, tumors implanted on, on, on their flank, you want to see how, for example, the size of the tumor changes over time. You want to see uh, changes in metabolism. You want to see how, you know, when, when, when the drug or the treatment, you know, causes changes, or how, sorry, or when uh, a certain concentration of the drug changes over time. Those are the kind of things you're interested. In. Uh, so this is this is this is very very standard from a biomedical perspective. But uh, the question then becomes, you know, how is the data typically analyzed? Well, then we'll, we'll get a little bit into you know the the the, the math of it. So basically, uh, the way this is analyzed is using a linear model. So because we're we're having you know treatment groups and we have in we're having time the simplest form of this model will be well you want to see the response of some individual or or subject in a in a treatment group being control or or treatment and then you have your mean group or your uh, intercept and then you have your coefficient for treatment and then you have your coefficient for time and then you have an interaction term because you want to see you know how time and treatment interact uh, so time, time and treatment will be your fixed effects, uh, and then the betas, one and two and three are going to be your linear slopes of the fixed effects, and then you have an error, right, to be assumed uh, normally distributed. So this in uh, statistical lingo uh, is called, you know, repeated measures ANOVA. This is basically the form of the repeated measures ANOVA you would use in situations. Um, but the same applies to, for example, a linear mix model, which is the exact same structure. The only difference is that you will have a random effect, you know, that allows you to put intercepts, you know, per individual to see if there are differences there. Um, but the construction of the model is exactly the same. Um, now, oh, so, so one thing I'm, I forgot to mention is, so this type of model, as the name implies, um, assumes that the, the trend over time, it's linear that the, the, the change over time follows a linear trend. Uh, being it a repeated measures ANOVA or a linear mix model is the same for both. Now, uh, I have some examples here of you know, some, some actual data that has been collected and published. And um, how does the trend look over time? So this paper on the left, it's a, it's a really influential paper in the, in the um, preclinical um, uh, Biomedical uh, cancer research area, uh, and uh, they they you know they had some tumors and they were getting some measurements from tumors, and they were doing at the scale of hours, and you can see that the trends are not linear. Uh, whatever they were collecting, so here I, I think they were collecting uh, measuring the the size of the, the blood vessels in the tumors, and then they had some metabolism measured like in redox. Uh, these trends are not linear; they don't follow a linear trend. And then we have um, this other study that you know. Similar thing, they were doing two treatment groups, one with radiotherapy, the other one with not. And then you can see that um, concentration of oxyhemoglobin, saturation of oxygen in blood, over time is measured at the scale of days. Uh, and there are differences, you know, the, the, the groups are, are not following the same trend, but uh, the trend is also, not, is also not linear as well. So um, the issue is that a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, the signal we collect in biomedical studies is not does not follow a linear trend, and then uh, if you fit a repeated measures ANOVA or a linear mixed model, uh, as as they are the way they typically are are done, um, you are fitting a line a, a linear trend, and for example in this case if you fit a linear mixed model or repeated measures ANOVA, uh, it's going to capture the overall trend, but it's going to miss for example this this huge jump in uh, in oxygenation or sorry in hemoglobin concentration. Or is going to miss as well this huge spike here. So those are the the places where you might be having uh, biologically or physiologically important changes. 
but your model is not being able to capture them. So one way you can correct for this is that you can use polynomial effects. You can use polynomial effects in a um, linear mixed model. Uh, but one problem with polynomials is that um, they tend to have issues at the, at the extremes of the covariates. So that can create biases at the boundaries. So that's something you, you don't want. You don't want you know, the, your, your uh, polynomial for saying it's going to go up when it's actually you know, staying uh, pretty linear, if that's the case. <clears throat> so you know, how, how, what, what other way can you use to, to analyze uh, your data? So uh, here we have a generalized additive model, which is a semi-parametric class of models. And you can notice that it has pretty much the same construction of the linear model we saw before. You know, we have an, uh, uh, a mini or an intercept, and then we have a coefficient for treatment. But instead of having a time um, uh, co uh, coefficient of time in the for, for a linear term of time, we have uh, this, this function here, uh, which is going to help us model the change over time. And it's going to be a... <clears throat> Uh, so it's what, this is called a smooth function. And the inputs here are going to be the unit time covariate and the, the parameters of, of, uh, of beta. And so, so the idea here is that because we are not telling the model explicitly, we're, we want to model time as a linear trend, uh, we can use a type of smooth function to model how uh, the trend over time changes. And we can, in fact, use a basis function to estimate the smooth function. So a basis function is, you know, a function that you can use to compute this smooth, smooth function. Uh, and uh, one type of uh, basis function that is really useful are splines. So, uh, for example, thin plate regression splines are a class of, um, you know, the easiest way to put it is, is like they were like polynomials, third degree, poly third degree, poly third degree polynomials uh, pieces joined together. Um, and they're computationally efficient. And uh, they allow you to estimate, you know, use them to like piece them together to uh, capture a trend over time. So, and, and I think this, you know, without getting too, too crazy on the math, the easiest way to understand this with, with a visual example. So for example, say that we have uh, here, we have here um, and some function. This is a trigonometric function. I think this is a sine or a cosine function. Uh, it's going to uh, change over time, right? And then um, if we have this function, and we simulate some normal distributed data around these time points, we will end up with the points you see uh, in panel E, right? So this, we just, we, we tell uh, our computer program, just, you know, generate some uh, normal distributed points around that mean. And uh, then we wanna feed a generalized additive model. So what will happen is you will have your basis functions, which are your splines, and uh, your algorithm is gonna, you know, um, get the, the splines and, and do uh, restricted maximum likelihood uh, estimation. Uh, and then what's gonna happen is, so you notice here, for example, that we have, <clears throat> here we're modeling this function. We wanna capture this trend using four basis functions and an intercept. And you can see, for example, that um, basis uh, function number two, this, this green one here has this like V shape. And uh, what's going to happen is we're going to penalize how how uh, how weakly to put it in 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 in, in, in to, put, to put it to, to give a name to it how weakly this uh, spline functions or this basis function are going to get to uh, capture this trend. So for example, <clears throat> we have here the basis function number two, and then you see that for basis num function number two, it's going to be penalized by 0.07. And effectively, what's going to mean is if, if we multiply this number by the basis function, the values of the basis function are going to become close to zero. And this is what we see here in panel D. So from going from a V shape, it's going almost to a flat line, right? Because the coefficient has taken all the way down. In contrast, if we see a uh, basis function number one, then you see that it's the, the penalization uh, matrix actually saying it's going to increase its value. So it's actually here is a little shorter, here it's become larger. And we do that for everyone. And then we add up the, the basis functions uh, at each time point. And then the result is what we have here in uh, panel E. So we have the normal distributed points from those. We can, when, you, when we add these pieces together, we can recreate this trend. So that's basically how a generalized additive model and the smooth selection works.
of course, you know, you're not doing it because of this by hand, you know, it's doing so completely by, uh, by an algorithm, the computer takes care of it. Uh, and, you know, there are, there are um, some things you can do if you want to, you know, change some, some specific type of uh, basis functions. So we're not, by general speaking, someone that is interested from a medical perspective to use this on uh, internal data uh, shouldn't have to run like maybe five or six lines of code at the most and get a reasonable estimate. So I'm going to illustrate how this works with some simulated data. So this is uh, some data from a paper that was talking about uh, how uh, melanoma type of cancer in the skin could be treated using radiotherapy. And um, this is just tumor size, right? So over time, people that were collecting this data were measuring the size of the tumors in the two treatment groups. You can see that in T1, um, the treatment that they're doing is causing the tumors to grow slower at some point. And uh, the other group, the tumors keep growing faster. So if we do what I showed before and we fit a generalized additive model that you know has a smooth functions for each one of, one of the groups, we should be able to capture the trends of the data over time. And then we have fitted the gamma here. So uh, again, the points are just the same data we had before. Um, the lines here are just uh, our, 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 our estimation or mean. And then we have a confidence interval. And um, this is a, um, forgot. Uh, so it's not a point-wise confidence interval. It's across the function confidence interval, meaning that if we draw you know, multiple times uh, sample from the posterior, then we are going to get uh, 95 percent. If, if we do it 100 times, 95 of the whole curve should be within the boundaries of the confidence group. So overall point is the model captures the trend of the data. If we had had we had fitted a uh, repeated measures NOVA, then we would have like a linear trend, right? And that would miss, for example, this dips and ups and downs that we have here. But our model has been able to capture it. And you know that's that's the first part. So you can you can fit a model. Uh, the other part is when you're trying to answer the question of, of well, okay, so we you have fit a model, you have captured trans data. Um, how can you tell if the two smooths you have fitted are actually significantly different? So um, in general, as IT models, it's a little different from you know the for example for example the post hoc comparisons you would do with uh, repeated measures ANOVA. Uh, what we do is we want to estimate the differences between the smooths. So we have a smooth here for T1 and we have a smooth here for T2. We have fitted those smooths from our generalized additive model. So what we uh, are going to do now is that we're going to estimate the difference between them and we're going to construct a confidence interval. And the, the, the easiest way to conceptualize you know, how this works is um, if you're giving uh, treatment to a group of animals or you know to some patients and you have a control in a treatment group uh, you want to see that whatever you're measuring is different over time right because if you're giving a chemotherapeutic drug and you're giving uh, a control to two different groups and you see for example that the tumors if, if you're doing uh, uh, cancer research uh, if you see that the tumors grow at the same rate then probably the treatment this isn't doing anything, right? So you want to see that there is a different that the, the trends are diverging over time. So if we estimate the difference between the smooths, for example, you can see here that at the beginning the the size of the tumors when the, the measurements started are pretty close, you know, are indistinguishable from each other. So probably the treatment <clears throat> wasn't done anything back then, right? At some point. The, the the accumulative effect of the treatment kicked in and then you can see that there's a diverging trend. So for at the beginning for the you know first eight days of measurements, the difference between the two groups is probably going to be not significant. So this is what we do. So here what we have in this graph is we are comparing uh, T1, right the, the green group to T2. Uh, it's like we were subtracting the T2 from the values of T2 from the smooth of T1, which you know would be will give us a negative number because these values are higher. And we can see, as I said before, so for the first uh, eight days or so, uh, our confidence interval is is uh, within zero, uh, co covers zero. So we can say that you know, generally speaking, there is no significant difference uh, at that at that point. 
But as we see from the figure, you know, by day 18, the trends start to diverge enough that we can get a difference. And then where our confidence interval is uh, below or above zero, then we have a, a significant difference. So we would say, you know, um, we saw that by day 18, there was a significant difference in the trend of, of the of tumor growth. And, uh, oh, wait, my slide is a little bit out, but why is this important? So um, this is important because if you have this estimation and you say, okay, so the change happens, my model is telling me that significant changes happens around day 18. So you might be interested then in, 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 in looking further and you know, what all the biological or the metabolic, metabolic or physiological reasons why this change is happening here. This can help you refine your experiments. You know, so maybe next time you do this, you will, you will try to get some additional measurements uh, from your knowledge of, of, uh, of your field. You should be able to, to like have a, a, an educated guess of what might be happening here and you can further explore. Um, so this is something that, you know, that's that's the value of I believe of the model. That's what helps answer. Plus that it you know follows the actual trend of the data. So um, to conclude this part of the talk, uh, generalized attitude models are useful to analyze and tunnel data because they provide you know a model that captures the, the nonlinear trends in the data. If if uh, you have you, you that's the case for for your data, um, and you know can help. Uh, do a little bit more focused research and you know what might be the changes that are happening at that time so meaning being metabolic physiological you know once you have a um, an estimation that when the change is happening then you can go and explore um changes around that time point and then that'll, that'll probably will give you more insight in what's actually going on so this is your most or like a, most like a more like a mechanistic thing of why this is useful and, you know, uh, as I said before, it actually let the data speak for itself. Uh, you're not trying to impose a linear trend when there's probably not one. Uh, and you're just letting the data, you know, follow the trend it's going to follow. And then you fit a model that is consistent with the trend of the data. Um, and then for, for the last part of, of, of my talk, uh, I would like to talk about, uh, you know, so we have talked about, I have talked about public uh, health research and, you know, doing a little bit more with your data so you get more insight. And I talked about general science models. Um, but there is this huge uh, need that needs to be addressed. It's an ongoing need. And is that how you make your research reproducible. And I think that's especially important in the case of uh, health data, being public health data or health research in general, uh, because when you are, for example, presenting a method like mineral acidity model, uh, if you have the graphs on your paper, those are going are gonna to look nice. You're going to say, hey, we have, you know, we allowed you to do this and this. But um, if you don't provide the tools that you use to create your model, or if you don't let people see the code you use, uh, they won't be able to reproduce, uh, the not reproduce, but they won't be able to use um, the model, for example, for their needs, or if they're interested in the data itself, they won't be able to take a look at it. So how are we addressing this in, in our research? Uh, so what we typically do is that we use GitHub uh, to share everything. And wh what I mean by this is uh, we share the data we use for making our, our, our uh, we, data we collected or data that we have received to make our studies. And um, we share the methods, we share the code, um, and we put everything on GitHub so that if you, and with instructions, of course, because otherwise, you know, it's, it's it, it wouldn't make any sense, but if you follow the instructions, you know, if there's software you need or things you need to install, you install those, then you can clone the repo where you have everything. And the idea is that when you have everything in place, you can just click a button and you can basically recreate the whole paper. So that uh, makes reproducible, you know, whatever uh, we share in the paper. It also allows people that are interested in the code and seeing the methods, you know, to go and see how the methods are actually working um, and uh, addresses the need of, you know, sharing what you do in a way that it's open and that uh, benefits uh, the most, uh, the most. So, for example, um, I, I can, I can, uh, I don't think I have a link for my slides, but I can certainly drop the link of the repo if someone is interested on the Zoom chat. But um, 
this link here, for example, if, if, if we were go if we were to go to it, uh, you would see the repo we have for for the uh, the, the the general identity model, which is a paper we, we published back in 2022. And uh, you would, would be able to follow instructions along. You would be able to like get everything and be able to reproduce the whole paper, figures, uh, all the sections of paper, the analysis. There is a code, so everything should be able to reproduce. Uh, with the COVID nineteen work I showed before, uh, work is ongoing. Uh, I have a friend a little bit of a problem because the files we use to create the, the our, some of our analysis are a little bit large, and then so there's a little, it's a little challenging to, to share them. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll manage those issues. And by the time we are ready for submit our, our paper, we have finished everything, we'll have a re repository in place. So everything is again, you know, shared and is open. And whoever wants to take a look at how we did analysis can go and take a look. So uh, so that's how, how we're reducing reproducibility. And I would like to close uh, the talk saying, you know, there is an ongoing need um, of analyzing public health data or Maybe you can think about reanalyzing data in a different way uh, to address disparities. Then you know they're all they're always present. And we, we I showed before what we have done for vaccination. Uh, there are other needs. Um, there are maybe differences that you that may be worth exploring at the geographical level or uh, uh, interprovincial level. Um, there's always an ongoing need to 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 analyze uh, this type of data and. Uh, different ways of seeing you know how you can analyze your data so i talked about data and information so uh, for example in the case of general identity models those are methods that allow you to extract more information from the data uh and that can be you know, important if you want to address some uh biological changes or things that you might be interested on and with that i'd like to uh, uh close by uh acknowledging uh all the um uh, uh, agencies that have funded our research through the years. Uh, so now I'm currently, you know, at the uh, lab of uh, Wishon Nasri here at the Université de Montréal, and uh, I'm working with uh, also uh, Idris, uh, Rado, working on some uh, uh, data here in Quebec, uh, Fatima and Rado working about something about floods and mental health. Uh, I also, you know, when I was doing my PhD back in the States, uh, I was working in the uh, lab of Dr. Muldoon in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And also uh, work with uh, John Tipton, who is not now at Los Alamos National Laboratory, which uh, you know was a was part was a, a co-author in the general you know, identity model paper. So all these are and the, you know the center of the CRM, uh, Mathematics Public Health, the Phil's Institute, which provided not only with the data but has funded the research. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that'll be all from from my side, and uh, I'll be happy to take any any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aya. Uh, now, is there any uh, questions? So, uh, I have a question concerning the, the cleaning of data. What kind of assumptions or challenges that you got to clean the data for the, the first and second part? Um... Well, <laughs> that's that's a long story, but um, so I would say the probably the the, the major challenge is that or, or was that um, as I said before, uh, the health regions approach is relatively new. So so, uh, you know, uh, we did some things that I didn't talk about for, for the model. For example, we uh, the ST, the people who answered the survey. Uh, when we looked at the numbers, they the the proportion, you know, for example, of what of of uh, uh, racial minorities and the proportion of uh, white individuals and proportion of people that were answering from each of the regions, they those were matching the provincial as uh, total total. So, for example, we had to correct for those. Um, one challenge with that was that. Um, we were only able to correct up to a point of you know saying this health region has this much people. Uh, it wouldn't be nicer if our data our data would have allowed to make your correction you know at, at a more granular level granular level, maybe at the level of the local integration health network that are within the health regions. Uh, but the problem is that there is no 
So the some of the data for you know how many people have uh, were in 2020 in 20 I don't know what the what the, so the last census was 2020 2021 I think um, the version for 2016 I think or so there is a number that tells you uh, there's a, a, a document from uh, the Census Canada that tells you uh, how many people were within the local hill integration networks that information does not exist for the hill regions so that's that's one of the challenges so there's a huge lack of information. Um, the other thing, it's just about, um, geography, uh, because for example, it, uh, turns out that, um, there are some places in Ontario, at least like in two or three instances, uh, where a city has the same name of another place in Ontario. So, uh, in that case, you know, was uh, showing that we had, we were analyzing and we, we saw that we had duplicates. So we had to go and, you know, make a decision, um, because the, the data we got, you know, is completely anonymized. So we don't, we don't get like, a coordinate of where people were answering. We just get a name of a city. So you have to decide, well, are we going to, are we going to sign into this or this side? So we had to make an edu educated, educated, educated guess in a couple of, a uh, couple of times, you know, saying, well, uh, we have the city with the same name. We had to go look at the map, look at the demographics, and we're probably going to assign to this to this region. So those are the challenges, you know, that uh, we encountered. Um, second part, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, th I wouldn't think we done. We we did a lot of um, data cleaning. Um, it was mostly simulation, but uh, yeah, I realize now that when you were with you know survey data, things can get very complicated very quickly. And what was the kind of questions that you took in account to uh, build the statistical model? Was it the direct question, are you with or against vaccination, or did you take the vaccine or not? What was the, the question? Right. Um, so we took, uh, it was a direct question. So people were asked, uh, have you taken the first dose of a vaccine? That was we used. Um, and you know, this is one of, this is, so, the other thing here is that you, um, the model you build and how, how much information you can, you can extract from your data depends also in um, how many data, you know, the amount of data you have. So um, uh, in a sense, you know, this was a little challenging as well because the survey we got, the information we got was designed so that um, people could answer, but they could also uh, drop out of the system at any point. So that caused that, you know, some people would answer, I am within the, I don't know, the 25 to 59,000 income bracket, and I live in the city, and I, I am white, white Caucasian, for example. And they, for some reason, they said to get out. So you lose all the other answers that they could have provided. Um, so in that case, you know, that answer is, is you're not going to be able to use it because uh, with those three covariates, you, you don't have a vaccination status, you don't have a age group, you don't have other things. Um, so we had to make some choices and, you know, uh, what information we were going to use and what information we were just simply not going to be able to use for, to, to, for a model. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there any question? Uh... I think not, but thank you very much for the interesting and great talk. And uh, for the people attending, thank you very much and see you in the next seminar. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you everyone for